Hello everyone. Well, there I was peacefully making my hydrogen video, you know, explaining the myth and the delusions about hydrogen, when in came a comment on one of my videos saying, what do I think of Miliband's flywheel idea? And when that came in, I didn't know about it. I was busily working. And whilst I'm aware of what flywheels are used for in the energy system, which is to really stabilise frequencies and take care of very, very small time increments to smooth things out. I wasn't aware that our energy minister, Ed Miliband, I completely lost the plot with claims that flywheels are going to help balance our grid in terms of storage, taking, an, you know, uh, excess energy, which we still pay the full price for, of course, uh, and moving it in, into periods of high demand. This is a nuts idea, and Ed Miliband is easily the most dangerous um, person in the UK at the moment because he's going to ruin our economies. I mean, this last week we've closed, we we, we you know we've closed Tartar Steel, we've closed our last coal mine, uh, we're doing away with Grangemouth, um, costing thousands of jobs. We're, we're clo we we've stopped new um, exploration of the North Sea, and uh, and so on and so on and so on. And we are, this man is so dangerous, he's fanatical. But the worst thing is, he really doesn't understand the most basic, basic things about energy. Now, let me give you one of my problems. When I go to research these things, and like flywheels, I look for how much storage, how much energy they can store. You'd think that would be a simple issue, because that's measured in megawatt hours, kilowatt hours, gigawatt hours, but it's measured in hours. But no, all you get is, oh, this flywheel can do 20 megawatts. Well, that's meaningless, unless I know what time it can maintain that for, because that gives me the amount. And I... I I've actually been in situations of public meetings where I've gone up to so-called experts who didn't understand the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. Uh, and I find that amazing. So the kilowatt hour is the amount of energy. That means one kilowatt for one hour. A kilowatt is meaningless unless you know how long it can last. It, it, it's meaningless. And yet all the time journalists uh, uh, and e e e even, you know, promotions, videos, just use the megawatts or the kilowatts without giving me the storage. So it always takes me extra time to try to find out how much storage is in these things. Now, from the outset here, I knew that flywheels can store a very little amount of energy. And so I'm going to explain in this video just how stupid this man is. And the idea is to avoid blackouts in Britain. Well, I'm sorry to say this isn't going to help at all with blackouts. Well, flywheels aren't new, they've been used for a long time. I mean, the early steam engine used them to smooth out the power, as it were. And that's their role, smoothing out energy over small increments of time. And even if you look at the modern engine here, you'll see we still use flywheels. You know, this is a, this is a four-cylinder engine, and the flywheel helps smooth out the power. It carries the, the, it has the inertia between the strokes, as it were. That's the role of flywheels. We will now take a look at Ed Miliband's bonkers plan. So there is the claim. It's to prevent net zero blackouts because of the intermittent nature of solar and wind. But it doesn't do that. In fact, it doesn't do that at all. The National Energy System Operator, that's and so is the brand new organization taken over from the national grid and is public, publicly owned. And they state if there's a sudden change in system frequency, and note the word frequency there, please, the weight and inertia of generators means they carry on spinning, even if they've lost power. This avoids a sudden change of frequency, giving time for our control room to restore the balance. So what we're talking about there is frequency. Yeah, tiny amounts of time to adjust tiny things, as it were. That is what they're saying there. They carry on. The scale of the problem is shown by the number of contracts awarded for so-called stability services, expected to total more than 100 by the time all are operational, probably in 2026. Nesso is now planning to open an entire new stability service market to encourage the construction of more flywheels or other services that back up the grid. So we're still talking about frequency. 
But then they go on to say, Nesso said the schemes would save the consumer money by cutting the need for maintaining backup power stations and importing power from overseas via interconnectors. And that is what I'm going to challenge. A spokesman said the pathfinders alone are expected to provide consumers with savings of £14.5 billion pounds between 2025 and 2035. Wow, so it sort of saves us from importing power from overseas. Well, that's not frequency, that's acting as a backup. There's a huge difference between using flywheels as a frequency adjuster, doing tiny little adjustments to stabilise the frequency on the network, to using it as a backup to restore power. Because the question then becomes, how much energy do flywheels store and how long can they last? So let's look at an example now, which used to be the world's biggest until recently when China built a slightly bigger one. And let's look at the one that's in the USA. And they call it a 20 megawatt one, a 20 megawatt flywheel system. We'll take a look now. As an example, let's take this beacon 20 megawatts flywheel plant in the USA. This is what they said to justify it. Beacon Power is building the world's largest flywheel energy storage system in Stevenson, New York. The 20 megawatt system marks a milestone in flywheel energy storage technology as similar systems have only been applied in testing and small scale applications. The system utilizes 200 carbon fiber flywheels levitated in a vacuum chamber. The flywheels absorb grid energy and can steadily discharge one megawatt of electricity for 15 minutes. Now remember that figure, one megawatt for 15 minutes. The system takes the place of supplemental natural gas power plants that have been used to balance supply and demand in grid activity prior, boosting energy production during peak demand and lowering production during peak supply. That is utter nonsense that I will now prove. So how much energy have we stored in that, the biggest at the time, um, flywheel um, plant in the world? Well, it was a quarter of one megawatt, which is, that's all it is. One megawatt for 15 minutes is a quarter of a megawatt hour. We need 7,200 gigawatt hours for the one nine day example I've often used when we went nine days without wind in the UK. And that is 7,200,000 megawatt hours. But we've only a quarter of one. And I can tell you now, that would support the national grid for just one two hundredth of a second. That's it. And even the bigger one that's been built in China is 50% bigger. So basically, you'd still have well over, well below a hundredth of a second <laughs> support for the grid. In other words, there is not enough storage, no matter what system you use. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're into. So clearly, clearly, there is no element of uh, grid storage to balance the grid for renewables with flywheels. None whatsoever. All there is, is the frequency adjustment. It's worth following up what happened to that beacon power plant. And again, in this statement here, they go on about it being used for the regulation of power grid operations, not just for the frequency adjustment. The storage systems are designed to help utilities match supply with varying demand by storing excess power in arrays of 2,800 pound flywheels at off peak times for use during peak demand. No, no, no. But let's carry on with the history. Beacon Power was founded in Woburn, Massachusetts in 97 as a subsidiary of SACCON Technology Corporation, the maker of alternative energy management systems. The company went public in 2000 and in June 2008 Beacon Power opened new headquarters in Tyingsborough, um, with financing from Massachusetts State Agency. There we are, the big subsidy. In 2009, Beacon received loan guarantee from the United States Department of Energy, there we are again, for $43 million to build a 20 megawatt flywheel power plant in Stevenson, New York, which is what we're talking about. The DOE loan for $43 million was awarded in 2010, with the plant to be online by 2011. It was also awarded $24 million from the DOE for a second flywheel plant. On the 30th of October 2011, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection under the United States Bankruptcy Court in Delaware. As part of the bankruptcy court proceedings, Beacon Power agreed in November 18 to sell its Stevenson facility to repay the DOE loan. So that one, and it was the world's largest at the time, went bust the same year that it opened. 
and it already had a total of 43 million plus a further um, sum of 24 million, so totaling 67 million pumped into it, lasted for months and went bust. So at this point we can clearly state that flywheels have no capacity, no ability to store any significant amount of energy at all. They have a role in adjusting the frequency um, of, or stabilising the frequency of the energy supply, mainly caused by, by the varying amount of intermittent energy coming in. So there's a big and growing need for that. But no question of them being able to store energy, to transfer it from a, 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 a um, excess time, to a high demand time. None at all. We're talking hundredths of a second uh, for that plant. And even the biggest one is still less, less than a hundredth of a second for the UK power supply. No chance at all. But let us move on to another aspect of it just to finally put the nail in the coffin. Looking at the cost of these flywheels, my source is from this paper, a review of flywheel energy storage, rotor materials and structures. I quote, the capital cost per unit power of a FESS system with a rated power output of 250 kilowatts and a maximum expected storage time of 15 minutes is $250 to $350 a kilowatt. That's the capital cost, if you like. But the corresponding unit energy cost is between a thousand to five thousand dollars a kilowatt hour a thousand to five thousand dollars a kilowatt hour that is seven hundred and sixty three pounds to three thousand eight hundred and sixteen pounds per kilowatt hour when gas today and we're talking wholesale prices here is sixty five pence per kilowatt hour that is 1173 times to 5871 times more expensive. But not to worry, the International Renewable Energy Agency estimates that the unit energy insulation costs of FESS will decrease by 35% by 2030, from the current estimate, and it's their estimate, of $1,500 to $6,000 per kilowatt hour, down to $1,000 to $3,900 a kilowatt hour. Wow! So if you hang on in hope, you'll only have to pay £763 to £2,977 per kilowatt hour, just 1173 to 4610 times the price of gas. So putting a um, two kilowatt fire on for an hour would only cost you around £6,000. And that is providing you're buying those kilowatt hours at wholesale prices. Look, it doesn't really matter what the exact price is. No matter what it is, it's exorbitant. It is totally out of the question as backup. But the capacity factor itself, the amount of energy the flywheel system can store, is so small, you know, a couple of seconds for the national grid, as to be inconsequential. It is not for backup storage. It is totally misrepresented in the press. And frankly, a lot of the advocates for it have no understanding of, of, of the logical background to it, of the actual maths, the actual calculations. And as the engineering part of me looks at these things, it is natural to look at the costs and the viability of things because I'm into a world that works and not a theoretical world. So now I hope this has armed you, the viewers of this, has armed you with the answers to why flywheel energy storage as backup to intermittence is actually not good, is incredibly expensive, can only be used for really frequency regulation, ironing out the frequencies, and even at that is very, very expensive. And of course, we need more of this, a lot more of this now, because of the intermittent nature uh, uh, and the varying all over the place of all these intermittent inputs. So it's an extra cost of the energy. You know, I, 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 I'm i just exasperated, quite frankly, at the world that puts all this forward. I can't keep up with all the false stories coming through the press almost every day. Um, and just to tell you, by the way, uh, some of you may, may want to know, I wear glasses because um, I've been having a left eye trouble, but I had an operation last Thursday during the making of this video, actually. And so uh, maybe in a month or so, I'll be able to take the glasses off at the moment. Of course, it looks 
absolutely blow up my eye. So uh, I don't want to distract people with that. It'll People will concentrate on that rather than what I'm saying. So um, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope it has yet again armed you um, to bring the sanity back into this renewable madness. Just one more thing before I leave you. Um, Brian Catt, the engineer physicist, um, this week actually passed to me a small video from Carl Sagan, um, which I think explains um, what the danger is in the West. Why all these, um, why all these governments are, are, are so deplorable at managing all this. Um, I was on JB News again yesterday, um, and again there's an ex-minister um, was on after me, and someone had already met in the green room. And, you know, it's clear they, they know nothing of what they're talking about. Yesterday it was about the madness of carbon capture. Um, but um, this short video, I think, is the nearest I've seen uh, to explaining how the madness happens, because it is madness. And so I'm going to leave you with that now. I'm going to leave you with this short video that I think is worthwhile listening to. So thank you for watching. There's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that I'm, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson lay great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. Never a truer word said.